What's up guys, Hitballs Neil here, back with a quick trilogy of reviews for this 4th of July holiday weekend, day, whatever. Um, so this review is going to include three pieces of media, notably Westworld Season 4 Episode 2, Well Enough Alone, Independence Day, and Independence Day Resurgence. So starting off with Westworld, I had a chance to watch the episode and essentially once you watch it you'll realize that what they're doing or what it feels like they're doing to me is they're rebooting the series but from kind of like a corporate reboot slash comic book style reboot so all the stuff that ha that's happened before is kind of leading us to this point where now D Delos um and Westworld are now being more run by machines and we have a few different parties at play notably the man in black and the lady who's uh, that Tessa Thompson plays and on one side and on the other side is Sandy Newton's character Maeve along with Aaron Paul on the flip side kind of the what well, feels like the resistance side so I don't know that Maeve has her own agenda at the moment, but it does feel like she is kind of leading the good side now, whereas the Man in Black and Tessa Thompson are now on the evil side. Um, so overall, it was a good episode, and of course, I particularly liked the ending of the episode where we have the reveal of a new world as a sequel to uh, Westworld, Shogun World, um, I think there was a World War II world. Um, so now we're going to have the basically the golden era, the roaring 20s, kind of the whole, I guess, the great Gatsby uh, jazz era kind of world. So I thought that was a very nice touch. So I kind of hope that we spend more time exploring that world and see how it ties into everything as a whole see and, and kind of see where why the man in black or delos is now picking this particular era um it kind of feels at first glance kind of like uh what we saw in the matrix or what we learned about in the matrix that there are certain eras that humanity potentially accepts more over others so i guess in this particular timeline our reality or the Westworld reality, that's probably the world in, with all the data that Delos has, that this is probably the best era for humanity to accept. Um, even, and potentially even, um, the robots are now using the information they learned from Rehoboam that the um, golden era, the golden age is the best time to ha control or the best era to use to control humanity. And they'll ultimately expand this to the planet or something like that. So um, those are just my thoughts. But overall, I thought it was a particularly good um, and interesting take as far as a good basis as far as the next generation of Westworld. So with that being said, um, being that it's Independence Day, I wanted to originally just rewatch Independence Day. But then I got to thinking that with all the negative press around Independence Day Resurgence, that I would rewatch the second movie as well, see how it holds up outside of the um, original fanfare and the negative reviews that it got, just to see how it holds up. So overall, one of the things that I definitely think still holds up for the first movie is the uh, reuniting of Will Smith and Vivica Fox, so their love story in the beginning, and then rounding it out with meeting after the destruction of El Toro Base. Um, and of course, a heartbreaking story of the president losing his wife, and then the story with him and his daughter, uh, Jeff Goldblum and his father, and all of that, and essentially all of humanity coming together with all of this particular loss. So, um, Granted, the first movie, you could try and say that cell phones, like as far as the flip side, that the negative is that, okay, cell phones would have solved it, but they kind of touch base on that um, unexpectedly or accidentally that with the aliens taking out our communications network, cell phones are not going to work. So overall, all of that work, they rely on Morse code and everything falls into place. So the first movie definitely holds up. Um, one of the things the second movie tries to do very well, or tries to do, but is kind of 50-50, is try to build on those relationships. So you have um, um, Vivica Fox's son um, becoming a fighter pilot, and then um, 
the president's daughter also being a fighter pilot, falling in love with, with um, the Helmsworth, Helmsworth brother that's in this movie. Their um, whole um, interaction and friction and all of that. And trying to build a new love story there. Um, and then um, or the Hemsworth, I guess Liam Hemsworth, I want to say. His um, best friend, his co-pilot, who's... Um, in, who falls in love with the Chinese pilot. So they're trying to build some of that stuff up. And I don't, it just didn't feel like it. Um, it worked as far as, okay, now, or under the assumption that this film is taking, or knowing that the film takes place 30 years after the first one. So I guess it all makes sense that all of this is going to happen. But that kind of felt like they're doing that whole the whole thing with the reboot with the next generation of pilots and all of that so it's okay i didn't think it was terrible or bad but it was just stuff that was part of the movie the main thing for me that's a big um, downside is not having will smith in the movie um reading a lot of the trivia is is that you he saw that he had a lot of conflict in his schedule with other films that he was working on but to me they could have resolved that by just having a five minute bit of um, introduction in the movie with his character. So I guess you have his off screen death as being a fighter or te- being a fighter pilot test to test the new technology with the um, hybrid engine with uh, human and alien technology. But by not actually showing that, you're kind of left to guess what happened. I, they might have, they showed his picture a couple of times. Watching it now, I might have even missed it this time if they even said that um he that's kind of what happened so for me they should could have just pulled an executive decision the film move start off the movie with um his uh, basically just that like i said a five minute sequence of him testing this new um fusion and the fusion drive in the planes and going wrong and tying that into the alien signal picking up the um, signal from the craft that was still on Earth and then launching into the movie after that. So by showing his death on screen, at least you resolve a lot of what's happening in the rest of the movie. So the whole thing with the signal still being on for the crashed alien ship, sending that back to the um, bigger and badder mothership, all of that work, the whole thing on the humans using the alien technology to enhance their own uh, weapon systems, technologies, and all of that, uniting the globe. All of that, for me, I liked and I enjoyed. I didn't think it was particularly bad or boring, but there was very, there was con- very, some certain connective tissue that you co- that was there that didn't really, that could have been there that needed to tie everything together, especially since you have a lot of cast from the first movie, um, notably Jeff Goldblum, Bill Pullman, and then the guy who plays Jeff Goldblum's dad, um, and then a lot of new cast members, and then like the kids have all grown up, So, and then you have Vivica A. Fox in there. So a lot of that stuff just, a lot of that stuff pulled together nicely, but you have the whole elephant in the room of Will Smith not being in the movie. So for me, grading the first one, it's a solid 90 to 95%. The only thing that's kind of that's really a stretch, but to me still plays nicely is Jeff Goldblum using his laptop to upload a virus to the alien ship, which is pure science fiction. Everything is, I mean, it's pure in the realm of science fiction. So for me, it's not necessarily a good or bad thing, but um, taking that leap of faith is the best way to um, acknowledge it and get over that. But in the second film, you have that elephant in the room with uh, Will Smith not being there. So... I would give the film a grade of about 80%. Overall, it was good, but you lose points for, like, so for me, the biggest thing about movies that, where I take away points is by telling and not showing. So granted, if there's real life issues of not having an actor in the film, you can't get around that, but it just feels like Independence Day Resurgence didn't do, they didn't really acknowledge it as well as they could have, and um it could have been handled a lot more differently so like i said a five minute scene at the top of the film even as like prior to the credits um with will smith doing the test run um could would have worked and when you get into the film later especially with the um 
um, interactions and friction between Liam Hemsworth and um, Captain Hill or Vivica A. Fox's son, it had a very Top Gun feel to it. So coming out of Top Gun Maverick now, you have that initial the opening scene with uh, Tom Cruise and going getting the plane up to Mach 10.3, if I remember right, or getting it to at least Mach 10 and then getting up to 10.3. Um, shows where his current state of mind is and resolves why he's not become a uh, admiral or why he's basically still stuck at the rank of captain. So you handle the elephant in the room right off the bat, and then from there you can move on and get into the rest of the movie with the rest of the cast. Which is why I think Top Gun Maverick did, is a lot is a lot better of a film and a sequel compared to Independence Day Resurgence. So. Um, like I said, Independence Day, I give it a solid A to A minus. Independence Day Resurgence, I give it about a B minus a C plus, just because um, essentially, I mean, I'm gonna overly simplify this, but for me, I would say give Will Smith a quick call and say, "Hey, we want you in the film. We understand your scheduling conflicts, so let's get you in here. We're gonna have your you're gonna basically be part of the." Um, introduction we're going to um, get you on screen um, do the test I test run of this fusion drive the aliens are going to intercept the signal you're going to crash and burn you're out and essentially that's what's all you know the, the filming take care of that in a day or two and you're all done and he can go back to his other projects and you know it makes everybody happy the film does better and it kind of ties in the original independence day to the new one and you can move on with the rest of your Independence Day resurgence without having to wonder more about what's going on with the film. Um, especially when you resolve the storylines for a lot of the other characters, especially like Bill Pullman and hearing the voices in his head still and dealing with that. Um, Brent Spiner and his character being in a coma and coming out of the coma. Um, you have the, I want to say African general who also, um, has, um, a very good role. I liked him very well, or I liked his role a lot in this movie. So a lot of stuff, they do a lot of stuff to build upon and progress the storylines of a lot of characters, but don't handle the one that needed to be resolved. And then that make that presents a big hole in the film. So overall, I still recommend watching the film though. I do like both of them and I do like that they set up the end of Independence Day Resurgence for a potential third film to make it Independence Day in space. So, you know, do another thing of 30 years later or 20 years later for that matter. You can actually could narrow that, that down now that we have that 2001 A Space Odyssey style sphere and they can now, you can now go to space, build more bases in the solar system and take it from there to explore the galaxy, go after more of these bigger motherships and take the fight to them. So hopefully on... I mean, I'm guessing the reason why we don't hear too much about a third Independence Day movie is because of the poor reception of the second film. But I want to say that now that we have all of this stuff out of the way in the second film, they can make another film, say, even 10 or 15 years later. You don't necessarily have to have Brent Spiner in it because of his age, but while he's, while he's still around, you can still have him in there. Same thing with, I want to say Bill Pullman, potentially, but actually, no, you can't have Bill Pullman because he died on the mothership, but you can have the rest of the cast, keep everyone else there, set it, you know, the film 10 years later, we've set up all these bases with that alien technology, and now we're ready to take the fight to them because now we can track them or whatever and set up a story around that, or even set up the story of 10 years later where humanity is, re is leading the resistance or something along those lines. So that's all there is for that. So um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or anything like that, you can comment on this post on Twitch at twitch.tv slash headphones Neil, on YouTube at youtube.com slash PatelN01, or on Twitter at PatelN01. But thanks for tuning into this particular review, and until next time.